Greetings, viewers, and welcome to our Stage 200 Service Manager Setup and Configuration Webinar, Episode 1. Today's presentation will consist of the following. An introduction to the Service Manager module, the feature functionality, setup and configuration, and the Service Manager SQL tables. Now, it's important to understand is that Service Manager is really the a module which allows you to track details about repairs and maintenance to external assets as well as internal assets and obviously create job cards from that particular from those processes so it really is suitable and ideal for any organization that really undertakes maintenance and repairs of items etc right let's get started now the first thing Realize is that Service Manager is an application or module which runs outside of Evolution. So therefore, it does have its separate, its own unique EXE file and separate install. And when installing Sage 200, you can you can choose to install Service Manager at the same time, or else there is an alternate option where you can install the application separately. Once the application has been installed. It installs to a default location under your program files in a folder called Sage Pastel and a folder called Sage Evolution Service Manager. If I expand that, you'll see that we've got a whole range of DLL files, which is what the application uses. And then very importantly, we've got the exe file, which is evolution sm.exe, which is used to open up the application. Now I'm just going to go to my desktop icon and you'll be able to see I've got my desktop icon there, which is pointing to the exe file. And very importantly is that you'd need to locate the database that you want to extract information from, which has been set up or created within your Sage 200 environment. So Upon opening up Service Manager, you're going to have the normal login screen for an agent and password as many databases. And if you look in the top left hand corner, it tells you that you're, link, you're logging into a Service Manager application. And it's simply a case of going to go locate the database that you want to connect to. So in this instance, I've got mine set up, and I'll just show you by using the edit option where it's a case of going to go specify the SQL server name the actual database name that you want to connect to. And after that, specifying once again the SQL server name, as well as the common database that your current company is using. Right, so that creates a process where the database is located. And once that's done, you're going to have your database appearing. It's simply a case of inserting the login name for your agent and password. and you can access the application within Service Manager. Firstly, um, we all know is that Sage 200 has got a very sort of detailed and efficient way where you can allocate access permissions to agents. And the same scenario applies within Service Manager. So I'm going to go to administration and We've got two options there, agent rights and user-defined fields. I'm just going to go to my user-defined first. And in the same way that you can set up UDFs within Sage 200, you also have that ability, or that ability within Service Manager. Uh, set up UDFs for three types of records. It's a service asset, service request, and a service task. And it's really quite simple. Use the add option and in the field name, insert the field name. Remember, no spaces in the field name. The field description, the actual data type from a drop down with various selections there. And then you can specify the field size. If you want to have a default value or force value. And then, as per normal, is that if you are going to be using a lookup option, that you need to just separate those options by means of a semicolon. Right. So you would then, if required, set up your UDFs for those three options. Now, one thing just to be aware of is that in Service Manager, you are only able to set up UDF fields on the headers 
of these particular documents or records. Whereas in SAGE 200, um, there's an option to set up UDFs for line options as well as headers. So just be aware that in Service Manager, you can only set up header UDF fields in the database. We then move to our agent rights. Really is quite simple. It's a case of selecting an agent. So if I open up my evolution database, I've set up agents, and the system is then going to go pick up the agents from this particular table and then allow me to allocate those rights and permissions from there. So I'm going to pick up an agent, and from there I can then go to each option and then specify what the access, access permissions are going to be for that agent, add, edit, delete, access, etc. So it runs through all the various options, and from there I can then go and allocate rights by either deselecting or selecting the option, simply allows the, uh, the user to perform a certain function or not. So the same way that you would allocate um, access permissions within SAGE 200, you can do it here. Um, and that will obviously be done by administrator within Service Manager. Now, as we know, is that we have within every module within SAGE 200, and scenario applies within Service Manager. So the first thing you'd need to go do is go to your defaults, and that's available under maintenance, and we then have our defaults there. And there's a couple of tabs, and these include the ledger accounts. So this is a just specification of exactly which GL accounts are going to be updated when, for example, an item or an invoice is processed within the application, for example, the sales accounts, the AR control account, inventory account, cost of goods, et cetera, et cetera. So they also specify the transactions, the invoicing, as well as credit notes. And really, it's a case of running through these options, ensuring that you selected the correct accounts to link to from within your existing GL account uh, structure. But just very important to understand is that you need to have at least one service item set up within your SAGE database, and that needs to be specified under your default. So I'm going to revert back to my SAGE database, and under inventory, I've got my inventory items there, and I've created a few service items. In this particular instance, it's just um, we create a service item as time that technicians are going to be spending repairing and maintaining and maintenance, and we specify that's a service item there. So just be aware that you are going to have to specify a service item uh, from your database under your defaults. Right, and then under our services, we've just got details about the different um, documents, service requests, service asset numbering, task templates, etc. And you can then go and specify if you want to use automated numbering, specify prefix, and also the character setup you'd want to make use of. Under the defaults tab within defaults, there are a couple of options here. And if you are going to be making use of or repairing internal assets, you need to specify an internal asset customer from your existing database. Just things, for example, about the default statuses and priorities, for example, in processing. And then also very important is that details about the availability of your technician time. So, for example, if your business operates from 8 until 5 um, and your technicians are available perhaps for a shorter period or longer period of time, you need to specify the details here. Um, and then very importantly is that when your technicians are billing, for the work that they're carrying out, is it going to be in different units? For example, hours, minutes, um, certain portions, etc. So specify those details here. And then also, once again, specify the service item that you are going to be using. Now, under our the meter and general reminder tab, um, we do have the option specifically for assets that are, for example, meter driven, for example, units, etc and we can then set up uh, meter batch numbering. 
as well as general reminder numbering, um, for example, as automatic numbers, specify prefix, and then also just specify the character setup that you want to make use of. So once again, in, very importantly that um, these accounts are set up correctly so that the integration between Service Manager and Sage 200 is working or does uh, correspond and that the GL is updated accordingly. So very important that these were set up correctly. So once it has been completed, you're really good to go. Now, there's a couple of options we need to set up under our and or configure. And the first one is setting up your geography. Under geography, there's three options, which is area, region, and sub-region. And just to understand is that um, there's really a trick in setting these up, because firstly, you'd need to set up a region. And what I've set up here in this instance is the region being a province. So you need to go to create a new one. It's simply a case of inserting a code in the description. But obviously, you could set up um, depending on your company's requirements. So I've got my region set up there. And then next, I'm going to make use of a sub-region. So I have a sub-region, and that's once again a code and description. And in this instance, you're going to link a sub-region to a region. So I've said I've got a province as a region, a sub-region being this town or city within that province. And then finally, I'm going to make use of an area. So an area is, in this instance, a suburb. So in this instance, I'm going to specify code description and then link the area to a subregion. So just be aware that it's a case of region being created first, a subregion, which is linked to a region, and then finally creating an area, which is then linked to a subregion. So in this particular instance, I've got my province, the town or city within that province, and then within that city or town, the actual suburb. But really, it's a case of this is just a geographical area. However, you could be quite creative in how you want to set up your areas, regions, and subregions. Obviously, just um, if you do have assets which are different locations, you can obviously then classify them and determine exactly where those assets are at any particular point in time. Right, so we've got the details about the regions. And then we need to look at things that um, the technician set up. Now, the technician set up is going to be details about the technicians who are carrying out the repairs and maintenance on the assets that you sold or you're going to be servicing, et cetera. And if I expand technician, you'll see a couple of options there. And the first one's going to be business units. So it's really just a case of classifying your business into different business units. And then you then are able then to link technicians to those units. So, for example, if technicians only perhaps doing servicing of in certain areas within the organization, you can then create business units from there. So it's just a case of a code and a description. And obviously that will be determined by your company setup, et cetera. Right, then we have um, qualifications. So it's very important just that we note or document the qualifications that the technicians need to be qualified for. It's uh, very common in certain industries that only technicians who have completed certain qualifications are able to carry out uh, repairs and maintenance on certain vehicle types or perhaps types of assets, et cetera. So it's really a case of if I'm going to add, I'm just going to give it, for example, um, a code there. And I can say, and then just give it a name. Right, so I'm good to go. And so I've got the details there. And I'm then going to go to my work code. Now, work codes are just really instances where I'm specifying, um, for example, time that I'm going to be charging or time billing, um, service consulting fees, et cetera. 
and that in turn then gets linked to a service item from my existing database and then obviously bringing through the cost so I can have for example a normal time I can have an after hours time etc and then I can link that to the relevant service item and then display the cost that I'm going to be billing or the cost of uh, that particular service request etc or fee now so you'd obviously set those up as required and then lastly we need to go set up our technicians so once again I'm going to go set up my technician and these are just for example details And then the contact details of this technician, which may be required, needs to be contacted after hours. And then I've got a charge rate, so I'm just going to save this record. And I'm then going to use whatever option I've got there. And then remember that I'm going to specify the actual cost, which is the cost of for the organization. And then the rates being the rate that you're going to be um, charging the customer for this work that you're going to be carrying out on the assets etc so I've got a rate and a cost there and I'm going to say yes and this is a particular charge rate that this technician is going to be accountable for but then we have things like qualifications and this is really very important where I'm going to list the qualifications of the technicians and as I mentioned it's in some industries technicians have to have certain qualifications in order to perform certain duties on certain assets. So you can certainly um, just go add a qualification here. Um, there's my qualification. And then a lot of the times is that some of those qualifications need to be renewed on a certain, on a, on a monthly or, or annual basis, etc. And then I can specify a renewal date. So I can specify the date when the qualification was achieved. And then when that renewal date uh, needs to be undertaken and then finally is that what I can do is I can go to document and then I can simply go and find that document um, perhaps the qualification of that um, particular technician let's go back in there right so I've got the qualification of that technician and I can add as many as I like and just say, for example, um, right, so I can specify the details there and obviously I can link multiple qualifications of documents onto that technician's profile. Here the details and uh, what's great is that from this particular screen I can simply go load and I can pick up the document straight away from there. We then have models uh, which we will come to later when we set up the models but the important thing to understand is that there may be certain uh, technicians who are only allowed or qualified to work on certain models so I can certainly go and specify the model here and I've selected that and there we go so it means is that this technician um, when this particular model comes in, they will be qualified to work on it. And I can then link multiple models to the technician's profile. And then finally, I've got a business unit whereby I can just link a business unit to a technician. Um, and I can certainly make use of multiple business units linked to one technician as there may be for me tasks in various areas within the organization. Right, so technicians, very important to set them up correctly. Contact details, the rate they're going to be charging for their services, uh, the qualifications that they have, the models that they certify to work on, and then also the business units that they're going to be uh, linked to or performing uh, services within those particular business units. Right. Then we can go on to the actual requests and this requires setup dealing firstly with the activities 
So an activity really is saying that any sort of form of activity or task that um, you're going to be carrying out within the organization that's going to be carried out by the technicians. So whatever it may be. So for example, um, And then just give it a code and just say, for example, and then we can then link those to the create and go process them. So any sort of activity that the technician will undertake, you can link them here with the code and then also a description. Now we request types, which you must set up as well. And I'm just going to go edit an existing one. And what this really entails is that giving it a code specifying exactly what's going to be undertaken. For example, inspecting of an appliance, perhaps um, all change, um, full service, etc. cetera, um, whatever the case may be. And then very importantly, the invoicing transaction type, as well as a credit note transaction type. We also can specify uh, the time in minutes that this task is going to undertake. And so, for example, this case is going to take three hours. So I've specified 180 minutes. And you see that we make this request type chargeable or not. So um, most obviously of these requests will be chargeable. However, there could be instances where no charge is applicable. If you think, for example, maybe on a, a warranty, whereby perhaps um, the first service or the first maintenance call out is non-chargeable as it forms part of a warranty or guarantee. So that particular option may not be chargeable. So therefore you can specify chargeable or not. And then very importantly is that if you recall under our defaults, we set up those uh, GL accounts for the integration. Now, what you is in a request type, you are able to override those transaction accounts. So you may, for example, want to have a different sales account, a different cost of sales account for this request type. And uh, you can specify that here. So it's a case of saying override transaction accounts and then just specify the different accounts for this particular request type. So if you're familiar with groups um, for customers, suppliers and stock items in Sage 200, the same basis applies. That obviously the, the other transaction types and then you have the groups, but obviously you can link the GL accounts to the groups, and then the group settings will then override the transaction type. So the same option applies here, and this can obviously be set up by request type. We then also have things like the um, setting up of the uh, transaction types for credit notes transactions. And then what we really have here is just the option to set up our activities. So remember is that request type may include certain activities and I can link them here. And one thing which is really quite unique is that um, if I add one here, you'll see that I can have order of execution. So it could be that perhaps in a certain um, process, there needs to be a certain sequencing of events. For example, one sequence has to be completed before the next one can start. So you are certainly able to order the execution here. Um, specify the activity and then just go specify the order of the execution of this particular task. So the order of execution and I'm good to go. So in this particular request type, uh, in the transaction types from the defaults and specify the activities and I'm good to go. So apply that and uh, we can then set up your request types that are required. This one thing that's quite important is that um, you are able to quite easily see which version of service manager you are using, and those details will appear in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. So I can see immediately from the screen that I'm using version 720.3.206. Um, but as we know in Sage 200, you find those details under help and about. There's also um, comprehensive help on online help option available for service manager, which you can obviously use uh, when required. Right, then we've got detail about the statuses. So statuses are just options where 
we can specify the status of a particular job or task. Then, for example, these are default status. And we can then have, for example, it's been opened, it's closed, the work is complete, it's been assigned to somebody, it's currently in progress, etc. So you can obviously create your own ones, but these are default ones. And then if you'd want to perhaps color code them if required. So um, as you can see, statuses would obviously determine the progress of these particular tasks that are being taken by the technicians. Then we also have things like our resolution codes. And these are also set up by default. You obviously could go create additional ones if required. So these would include things, for example, um, it's been canceled or it's been a write-off. Um, you're awaiting parts before you can complete the task, et cetera. It's been completed, et cetera. And obviously these are important um, in order to complete tasks and make them available for seeing when they're required. Right, and then we've got um, priorities. So if we look at my priorities here, um, once again, we can set up priorities. So for example, uh, you may have instances where um, you prioritize certain work, et cetera, or certain activities. You are then able to prioritize them and um, obviously ensure that the highest priority um, is attended to first, et cetera. So um, just be aware that you can set those up. So really very important that you are able to have a status for those tasks, a resolution code, and then also specify your priorities. Right, then we've got details about the asset classes. So we're gonna move on to assets and we've got certain classes of assets. So for example, depending on what type of business you're in, you can classify your assets uh, that you're gonna be repairing on or your items that you are going to be selling. And this really is ideal and useful for reporting purposes where you can see, for example, um, you're doing maybe the maintenance on certain or majority of maintenance on certain asset types or classes, et cetera. And so you can set them up there and use them quite effectively for your uh, reporting purposes. Right, then we have details about the make. So in this particular instance, if I'm gonna go back to my classes, I've got details about washing machines and microwave ovens, which is just a general classification for the assets. I can then go in a step further and say, for example, the make, where what I've done is I've actually listed the actual different makes of those appliances that I'm that I'm selling or performing maintenance on. And then very importantly is that you need to then go and link make to a particular class. So I've got my um, class there, and then I've linked a particular make to a class. Right, then we've got details about the models. And then models is just the actual model that forms part of a make. So I'm going to go and edit an existing one. And there's a couple of options that we need to go and look at. Right, so firstly, a model is the actual sort of appliance. Uh, we obviously normally have a model number, et cetera. So I've given it a code, which is the code of that model. And then the details about the warranty months. So normally we're selling um, vehicles or appliances etc there is some form of guarantee or warranty and i can specify those details within months i'm also able then to link this model to an inventory group and um, there may be instances where i'm buying those items in bulk from a deep from a supplier selling them to customers and then once i've sold those goods i'm implementing some form of maintenance or repair agreement, et cetera. So I can specify a default supplier there, and then also just give details of a full description of that item. And then what you'll see is that we can then go link the class and the make to this particular code or this particular model of item. Now, the couple of tabs which are really very useful for the technicians to make use of when they forming the repairs or maintenance. And the first thing would be like bulletins where I can add, for example, relevant information about this particular model. And then quite useful is error codes. So um, I'm going to go add one. It's simply a case of saying, for example, maybe there's an error code that appears on the, on the screen. Um, insert details about the error code, uh, a description of the code, 
and then what the causes are. For example, maybe the circuit is damaged, et cetera. And very importantly, um, trouble uh, ways that I can obviously correct it by using the suggestive action. So it's really a case of the error code, the description, what could be causing it, and how to resolve it. So this is really very useful. It really keeps a sort of a catalog of common errors. And then, for example, if you've got new technicians who aren't familiar with that model, they can simply refer to this option and uh, see exactly uh, what error codes are applicable and obviously ways in which they can resolve them while they're on site, etc. Right, then we've got details about spare parts. So obviously with appliances, motor vehicles, obviously I need spare parts. And uh, details, the spare parts link to this particular model. And also quite useful, for example, um, if a technician is going to go on site, um, they know what the error code is from this particular option, they can then know exactly which spare parts to take with them to, on site when they perform the particular repair or maintenance. Um, there could be instances where you've got subcomponents on a particular model, and you can obviously list them there. And remember is that this option is only available if I select the option that says enable subcomponents on this model. So tick that box and I can then add the subcomponents that I need to. The service assets will um, come to later when you add the service assets, but obviously you could link service assets to a particular model. And then customers, um, for example, which particular customers have purchased this particular item. And then notes, add relevant notes to, and then very useful is documents. So if you, for example, think you maybe want to add the user manual or user guide or operating instructions, you simply go add into documents, specify the description, and then you could have um, a centralized location where all those guides or user information for particular models are stored and simply go and specify where the information can be found. So as you can see, it really is um, a good way in order for you to maintain information about a certain model where you can obtain information from one centralized location. Right, so insert those details there, and obviously the more information you have there, the more useful it will be for your technicians. Right, so now what I've mentioned previously is that um, there may be certain assets that you are servicing that perhaps um, the, the usage is based on perhaps, for example, certain units, for example, kilometers traveled for motor vehicles, um, hours worked for heavy machinery, um, copies made for printing equipment or photocopies, etc. And you can certainly set them up there. So um, if you're familiar with the um, units of usage option within uh, fixed assets, the same scenario will apply here. Um, we can obviously set up those details and then obviously you can base service on number of units consumed, etc. Um, I'm just going to go into our, so I've set up my units here and I'm just going to go to our uh, service schedule templates. So if you think of a service schedule is that um, the manufacturers may determine that a vehicle must be serviced after a certain number of kilometers, a machine after a certain number of hours worked or completed, etc. So it's really the case of setting up a service schedule and um, giving a template, giving a name and a code, and then obviously linking that to request type. So and then obviously notes about this particular request type. And very importantly, there are three options that you can schedule on. These include date-based, a monthly schedule as well as a meter-based schedule. So, for example, if it's date-based, it simply means is that um, the service schedule must take place over a certain within a certain period, and you can specify the next schedule date. There's also a stop the schedule on a specific date. So, for example, if you think of a motor plan example, it binds for a certain uh, number of periods or kilometers, etc. Uh, you can say after once the service plan has exceeded or been completed, 
um, the service should then stop as required. And that's a date-based schedule. And then we also have the monthly schedule, whereby there's going to be a monthly setup in specifying which particular months this uh, sequencing would take place. And finally, we then have the meter-based schedule. And if I look at that, just a case of we'll set up meters, and then you can obviously um, specify what the current meter reading is, and then know that after a certain number of kilometers uh, or hours or copies, et cetera, um, that a subsequent service needs, needs to take place. So once again, we can set up the current meter reading and know that after a certain number of units that has been consumed, um, a subsequent service or maintenance task needs to be completed. Right. And so very importantly is that um, normally you would enter into some form of perhaps contract maintenance uh, with your customers that you would, for example, um, ensure that you're able to maintain their assets for a certain number of period or certain period, etc. And these are set up under your contract templates. So I'm going to go to my contract templates and what we have here is just setting up of a contract template um, and I'm certainly specifying details and then also alerts about this particular contract template. So once again, I'm going to go to my stock rates, okay? And these are just, um, for example, if I'm going to be doing a service after a certain number of kilometers, okay, um, which stock items or components do I need to have from my database in order to complete this particular um, service on the vehicle? Details about the billing. So for example, um, what the cost would be this particular service, et cetera, or task or repair. And then the charge rates, these are just the charge rates that um, the technicians are going to be, or the labor costs that are going to be linked to this particular template. And then details about any notes, any documents. So once again, I could perhaps include details about the service agreement that you have um, for this particular process, and then simply link them there um, on this particular template. Right, so as you can see, it's just that we're creating a template here. And I think if you're sort of familiar with the annuity billing module in Sage 200, it's a similar scenario. We're creating an annuity billing template, and then after that, we're going to go link it to an actual contract. So this is just the template that's gets set up. And I'm now going to go link this contract template to an actual contract. So remember is that I'm gonna go with my contracts now, and very importantly is I now have a contract. Now, the important to remember is that it is compulsory that you have a contract template that is linked to a contract. So, and what we're doing here is this is a contract that we're entering into between you as the organization and your customer. So I've got my details here and I'm linking it to this particular customer who I've sold the item to. Um, you'll see that we are able to have automatic numbering for contracts. So I've got my automatic numbering there. And then just very importantly is that, as you can see, we've got those stock items, the billing information, the charge rate, et cetera. They've all come through from my template. So very useful to have um, a template, which you may set up for, um, you know, for a range of appliances or assets, et cetera and then simply go link that to actual contract that you're entering into with your particular customer. Um, there's also the ability to go and modify or amend the, the, the contract. For example, you can maybe go and um, remove certain items which aren't applicable or add them as required. So you are able to, although it's been linked to a contract template, you are still able to go and um, amend and remove or, or add additional items or information to the contract that you're going to be entering into with your customer um, based on the fact that there are, could be that there are going to be uh, different based on the customer that you are going to enter into the contract with. Right, so just a, a important information there is that you have to link a contract template to a contract, very important. Right, 
we then have the ability to set up services. Before we do that, um, just be aware is that in SQL, there is a range of tables which are specifically linked to Service Manager. And if I go into my Management Studio, you'll see that there's tables with the prefix of underscore SMTBL. And these are all tables that pertain to Service Manager information. And so as you can see, there's details about the models, the makes, etc. Um, we've got details about the um, user-defined fields, user rights, etc. So uh, just be aware that if you're looking for a Service Manager table, just look for the underscore SMTBL prefix, and then you'll be able to quite easily identify the relevant SQL table that contains information that you are looking for. Right, we then move on to service assets. Now this is really the core area of the whole module. So I've done the initial setup, and now I'm going to specify the assets that I'm going to be working on, repairing, maintaining, etc. So under my service assets, there's three options there. We can say add from fixed assets. And in that scenario, it really is a case that you've got um, you've got assets that you are using within your organization. And you as an organization are responsible to maintain those assets internally. So for example, it may be um, heavy machinery or equipment, and you are then maintaining that asset internally, servicing it, maintaining, repairing it, etc. So what you'll see here is that I've got details about uh, the asset. It's an internal asset, which I've marked as such. And then I'm going to go pick up the asset from my asset master file and insert the details here. The interesting thing here about is that if I'm saying add from fixed assets, that obviously the customer information isn't applicable simply because it's an internal asset that's not relevant to customers. Right, that's the first option. We then have the ability to add from stock. So add from stock, um, the example, the typical example that you have here is that perhaps um, an organization that perhaps is renting out or leasing equipment. So you'd have, for example, your stock items as being those leased items. Um, you could then obviously classify them to inventory groups, place them in certain warehouses. And then you would then go and lease out that equipment to external customers. However, you are still responsible for maintaining those assets. So once again, it's a case of specifying the details, selecting the stock item. And obviously in this instance, very useful perhaps to use the serial number module, um, the serialized number modding, module, so you'd obviously keep track of exactly which assets are being leased and where they are, et cetera. So, um, normally that go together with um, your, if you're going to be using the add from stock option. And then you can obviously insert the details. In this particular instance, customer information is applicable because it's normally um, being leased to customers. However, we're looking at the option where we've got add. Now, this particular instance is that you may, for example, if you perhaps selling um, household appliances, uh, what you've done here is you've bought the items in bulk, you then sold them to customers, and based on the sale, you've entered into some form of maintenance agreement or repairs, etc. And uh, you then need to log this because you are then as an organization responsible for maintaining and repairing these assets. So we've got our service asset code here, which you can obviously set up as automatic numbering, yes or no. And as you can see, because it's saying add, by default, internal asset has not been selected. The great feature here is you can link an image to a service asset, which is obviously great for identifying the asset, what it looks like, etc. And once again, I'm going to now set up the class, make, model, etc. So I'm just going to go through to an existing one that I have set up. So let's go into that one over there. Edit feature, there we go. 
and I've opened up my civil assets. So I've got details of the asset here. Um, I've specified the class, the make, and the model of the asset. And very importantly, we've used our geography, which is really the area, so I know exactly where the asset is. And then usage information, and also the lifespan, et cetera, of the asset. Now, very importantly is I need to go link a technician to the asset. So this technician is responsible perhaps for maintaining the assets for a, a number of clients. However, this particular asset is linked to the technician. And then also details about the statuses. So I've said, for example, it's under guarantee and this is the particular technician who's linked to it, okay? Remember is that under technicians, you are then linking models um, to a technician stating that um, these models or this technician is qualified to perform uh, repairs and maintenance on these particular models. Now, in this portion over here, you see there's three options with regards to customers. We have a customer, a billing customer, and a warranty customer. So let's just start with um, the customer. So this is the customer where the actual asset is located. So it could be at the customer's premises. We then have the billing customers. So if you think of an example of perhaps maybe a head office and a branch, okay, um, the head office or the branch is where the asset is situated. However, the head office would be responsible for uh, the payment of repairs and maintenance. So they would then be the billing customer. And then you could obviously have a different customer or perhaps the holding company is where the warranty would be held. So as you can see, there's three options here. And just based on the scenario where the asset is located, you then have, you can specify those different options. You can then also link a rep to the asset. So for example, the rep who did the sale, you can then link them here. And those rep details will come through from your Sage 200 database. Um, you can also specify the exact asset location. I mean, for example, you'd want to know exactly where the asset is. And always good to know that so the technician knows exactly where they need to go to if any sort of um, uh, repairs or maintenance need to take place. We then have a couple of very important tabs here, uh, dates about suppliers. So for example, details about when you as an organization purchased the asset uh, from your supplier, details about the warranty date, et cetera. And then on the left-hand side, here, we've got details about the when was the asset invoiced, installation date, next service information, et cetera, et cetera. So always good to complete information just so that you know exactly all the information for that particular asset is relevant and updated. Then details about the service history. So any sort of um, you know, service information about when the service was completed, et cetera, that gets logged or stored in this particular tab. And then, for example, if there was a meter linked to this asset, uh, you can obviously have the meter details. And then very importantly, the billing. Uh, details about the billing uh, charges that were linked to the customer on this particular asset, um, details about the spare parts that would have been used in the maintenance of this asset, and then also very importantly details about uh, the time that the technician spent uh, maintaining or fixing this particular asset, um, any sort of notes, schedules, um, subcomponents, etc any sub-assets, okay, and very importantly, documents. So think of things like perhaps maybe the actual job card that was used on the asset uh, when the repairs or maintenance were being done, things like maybe the uh, sign-off by the customer, et cetera. So any documents that pertain to this asset itself can then be stored here, any maybe warnings um, that you could perhaps sort of set there for maybe other technicians who perhaps would be maybe working on this particular asset, et cetera. Um, so what's very important here is that if you think of, this really is a master file record. So if you think in Sage 200, you've got um, master records for customers, suppliers, stock items, and on those records, all the information is stored. So for example, under 
inventory, you've got um, a new quant on the inventory item, you've got details about the selling price, the cost price, um, reorder details, etc. Any transactions on the inventory item, um, the same applies here. So think of this as an actual record, a master file record, where you're storing all the information on this particular record. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go into another database where we do have where we do have assets, um, an asset that has been, um, uh, just check, yeah, an asset that where there is information and we can see exactly how those records information are stored. So I'm going to go to maintenance and I'm going to go to asset and service assets. And if I take one and edit it, um, I've got all my details here, and if I look at, for example, under um, service history, storing all the service history there, as you can see, um, these information or these particular service requests have been closed. There's been invoices, credit notes, etc. And as you can see, this one has been assigned, not yet completed. And I've also got details about the cost so far. Um, there's the spare parts that I use to perform the tasks, et cetera, the times that the technicians were spent, et cetera, and also any form of documentation. So really, as you can see, um, a record where any sort of interaction that's taken place on the asset is stored and can be retrieved and viewed from one centralized location. So from what you can see is that um, it's important that there is um, a setup, one configuration that's very important within this module. And it's always important to ensure that the setup is done correctly, to ensure that you've got the correct processing being done, but also that the relevant GL and records are also being updated within your SAGE to the database. And if you've completed that, then you can really start processing transactions. Um, so I'd like to say thank you so much for watching in and tuning into episode one. Um, it's over and out for me. Thank you for watching and goodbye.